Orthogonal Projectors. This material on orthogonal projectors and Pauli matrices is duplicated unchanged as lecture video D2B as well as the final part of lecture D2. This is because some people might want to just find it on YouTube by searching for Pauli matrices. But if you've watched it in one place, you don't need to watch it again. For a two-state system, let ket u and ket v be an orthonormal pair of state vectors, not generally the basis vectors, just state vectors. And let w be an arbitrary state vector, not necessarily normalized. We're going to define orthogonal projectors, p sub u and p sub v, as follows for the state vectors ket u and ket v. So the projector p sub u is defined as ket u times bra u. And we, we just saw in the, the prior section how to multiply those together. So this is the result. And this is the result for v instead of u. Now, u1, u1 star, that's magnitude of u1 squared. That's a real number. u2, u2 star, also a real number. Notice that these other two, they are complex conjugates of one another. u2 is unconjugated here and conjugated here. u1 is conjugated here and unconjugated there. So they're complex conjugates of one another. So every projector is a Hermitian operator, and so it is an observable. I believe that the sum of these two projectors, P sub U plus P sub V, equals the identity matrix, because U and V are orthonormal, and overall phase is arbitrary. Let's see what the, the P sub U projection of of or on or onto state vector ket w would be. So projector p sub u operating on ket w. p sub u is an operator. It, we could put it to the left of a ket and that, that operates on the ket. So p sub u is ket u bra u. And that's going to operate on cat w. Well, that's the same. That's identical to bra u and the inner product of u with w. That's what this bra and this cat do. They produce this inner product. And once we see that it's an inner product, it's just a number, and we could move the number to the left of the ket if we want. So we get this inner product, this number, times ket u. So this, this is a state vector parallel to ket u with a magnitude and sign equal to the amount of u that is in w, their overlap. If u and w are orthogonal, no overlap, the projection will be zero. The inner product will be zero. The projection will then be zero. If w is uh, some complex number times u, then when we plug, then the inner product is going to be um, alpha and the projection will be alpha times cat u. We will use these projectors in uh, the Pauli matrices and in the next lecture, D3, on spin one-half states. This is a possible time to take a break. 
poly matrices. We introduced them earlier, sigma 1, 2, and 3 poly matrices. If you're comparing against some other material, a book or a class, you, you might see, probably will see, the subscripts as being x, y, and z instead of 1, 2, and 3. That, that is true for the specific choice of basis vectors as z plus and z minus for a spin one-half problem. And we will use this in lecture D3 for spin one-half particles. But here we're talking about gen general generic two-state systems. So we haven't, we, we said our basis vectors will be orthonormal but we haven't chosen any directions in space. So we should stick with 1, 2, and 3, not x, y, and z. Now, a lot of books and classes, they teach you spin 1 half first. And so, you know, they're going to call them sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And that's fine, but we're choosing to do generic two-state systems first. So we're using 1, 2, 3, not x, y, z at this point. For the remainder of this lecture, when we use i, j, and k as uh, indices, subscripts, they can take on any value 1, 2, or 3. The poly matrices have many properties. They're all easy to prove. It, it, because 2 by 2 is a pretty easy system to work with. You should verify these results for yourself, but I'm not going to verify them with you. Try it yourself. The trace of a matrix, any matrix, any square matrix, is the sum of the main diagonal, the elements on the main diagonal. So the trace of a 2 by 2 matrix is the sum of M11 and M22. And that is zero for all three of the poly matrices. A result in linear algebra says that therefore the, the two eigenvalues of each poly matrix are going to sum to zero. The determinant of each poly matrix is minus one. If you don't know how to do a determinant, don't worry about it. We're not actually going to need it. The eigenvalues are plus, and min plus 1 and minus 1, and they sum to 0. If you know how to get, well, we already showed a formula for how to get the eigenvalues, and so you just have to plug in, and you will uh, be able to verify that the eigenvalues are plus and minus 1. Now, we, we need to discuss the normalized eigenvectors of each Pauli matrix. Um, but I'm not going to show you the procedure for how to solve for the eigenvectors. If you already know how to do this, great. If you don't, just trust me, or you'll be able to verify that they're eigenvectors without solving for them. Uh, verifying them is not difficult. So I'm going to give you the normalized eigenvectors of, of each poly matrix unique only to within an overall phase that we're not, we don't care about because it doesn't affect the physics. So in the following table, we're going to associate 1 with x, 2 with y, and 3 with z only to anticipate that we want to use these results in the next lecture, D3, on spin 1 half particles. Though if, if we're not talking about a spin 1 half particle, we should just stick with 1, 2, 3. Now beware. Here, we're going to use ket1 and, and, and uh, ket2, but here 1 and 2 mean the first and second poly matrix. We don't mean the first and second basis vectors of the two-state system, so don't confuse that. This is a possible time to take a break. For poly matrix sigma sub 1, which for spin 1 half is, is sigma x, it has two eigenvalues, plus one, minus one, no surprise. I'm going to tell you that the normalized eigenvector 
for the plus one eigenvalue is has this representation. 1 over square root of 2 times the column vector 1, 1 in our choice of basis. And we give that the name, the ket name, 1 plus or x plus. Now, you could verify this. You, you could take this matrix and multiply it to the left of this vector, and you would get out this vector unchanged, which is to say this vector times plus one. So you could check that this is a correct eigenvector without knowing how to find it in the first place. Now, I'm, we're going to use, for the minus eigenvalue, we're going to use this eigenvector, one over square root of two, one, minus 1. If you were to take this matrix times this vector, you would get this vector out, but multiplied by minus 1. It is true, and you should verify, that the x plus and x minus eigenvectors are normalized, and they are orthogonal to one another. Now, for sigma 2 or sigma y, eigenvalues plus or minus 1, the y plus eigenvalue, 1 over square root of 2, 1 i, the y minus eigenve eigenvector, 1 over square root of 2, 1 minus i. These two eigenvectors are normalized and they are orthogonal to one another not orthogonal to the x ones, but they are orthogonal to one another. Sigma 3, sigma z, eigenvalues 1 and minus 1. Eigenvectors 1, 0, and 0, 1, which we call z plus and z minus. These, this, these pair of eigenvectors, they are normalized and they are orthogonal to one another. Not to x or y, but to one another. Notice that the two eigenvectors of a Pauli matrix are orthogonal. Now that we have the eigenvectors, we can, if we choose, rewrite the Pauli matrices in terms of the difference of orthogonal projectors as follows. And we'll use the x y and z notation, not the 1, 2 notation. If we constructed the projector for x plus, which is ket x plus bra x plus, and we constructed the projector for x minus, which is ket x minus bra x minus, and we subtracted the second one from the first one. If you do that as a matrix operation, you will find that that exactly equals sigma x. And you will find the same thing for sigma y using the y projectors and the same thing for sigma z using the z projectors. If you change it a little bit, Instead of doing a subtraction, if you add them, we find that every case adds up to the identity matrix. This is a possible time to take a break. Now, we know what the Pauli matrices are. What if we multiply one Pauli matrix times itself? If you do that, you will find that you always get the identity matrix. So, Every Pauli matrix is its own matrix inverse. And this is consistent with why the eigenvalues are plus 1 and minus 1. The Pauli matrices are also Hermitian. And so if they're Hermitian and they are um, their own inverse, they also are what, what is called unitary. Their Hermitian con conjugate is their inverse. We're not going to need that 
in our course. Now let's multiply two different Pauli matrices together. If you multiply sigma 1 to the left of sigma 2, you, you would find out, you will find out, that that is exactly Pauli matrix sigma 3 multiplied by imaginary number i. And if you took sigma 2 times sigma 3, you would get i times sigma 1. And if you did sigma 3 times sigma 1, you would get i times sigma 2. But if you, re if you reverse the order, instead of doing 3 times 1, you did sigma 1 times sigma 3, you would get minus i sigma 2, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of order and pattern in these Pauli matrices. And it, it directly relates to angular momentum. We don't know that yet, but it does. We can, res we can uh, there's a shorthand for writing all six of these in one equation. Um, at, the shorthand requires you to learn something new. You could say, well, why do I want to learn that? Why don't I just use those six? You, either way, if you want to know the shorthand, you will see it in books. Every book that shows you the multiplication of Pauli matrices will show you this shorthand, so I might as well show it to you. Let i, j, and k be any elements, you know, uh, of one, two, or three. If you multiply Pauli matrix sigma sub i times Pauli matrix sigma sub j, you will get a Pauli matrix sigma sub k multiplied by pure imaginary number i. Notice that this i is not the index i. But then there's this funny symbol, epsilon ijk, which is called the levi civita symbol, the permutation symbol, the anti-symmetric symbol, or alternating symbol. And it has this rule. Epsilon ijk is plus 1 if ijk is 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2. It's minus 1 if ijk is 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, or 2, 1, 3. It's zero if any of them are repeated, i equals j, j equals k, or k equals i. So the value is plus one for even permutations of one, two, three. One, two, three, if you shift, if you rotate them one to the left, you get two, three, one. If you rotate it uh, once again, you get three, one, two. It's minus one for odd permutations, and zero if any index is repeated. Now. If you want to say, no way am I going to remember all that, just so that I can write six equations as one, but then I have to remember this funny symbol. If you don't like this symbol, that's fine. You're not going to need it for this class. But if you were to look at a book or another class, you would definitely use that symbol. That's how things will be written. So beware that, you know, that unsubscripted i was not an index or a subscript. It was the imaginary unit. You could say, gee, we shouldn't have used i as an index or a subscript if we knew we were going to use i as an imaginary number to avoid confusion, except everybody does it this way. So every book will do it this way. So that's the way you need to see it. I wouldn't be doing you any favors if I didn't call it I, because then you would look in a book and you'd be confused. This is a possible time to take a break. The commutator of A and B, which we write as square bracket A comma B square bracket, the commutator of two operators A and B is defined as AB minus BA. The commutator of Pauli matrix matrices sigma i and sigma j using the, the work we've already done the commutator is commutator of sigma i with sigma j is 2i epsilon ijk sigma k so we don't have to write out six commutators 
that one formula tells us how to do the six commutators. We just have to remember how to do the epsilon. Well, that's quite a lot of properties and of the poly matrices, and I, I'll tell you that they are actually all interesting and useful properties. We haven't really used the properties yet. We've only said what the properties are, but they actually are very helpful and interesting properties for two-state systems. And we got all those properties without needing to introduce spin one-half yet. You know, if you look at a book, a book is going to start teaching you spin one half and it's going to give you the poly matrices and, and tell you what they mean for spin and, and show you, you know, how, you know, uh, how they get multiplied and how they get commutated. And you are for sure going to end up with the belief that these magic properties of these poly matrices are because of spin one half. But I tell you, they are not. They are properties of two-state systems. And spin one-half is only one two-state system. Probably the most important two-state system. But the, the properties of the poly matrices do not come from spin one-half. The properties of the poly matrices help us understand spin one-half. We will use these properties of the poly matrices in the next lecture, D3, on spin one-half particles. This is the end of lecture D2.